What is up guys, Blue as always. Before the video starts here, I just wanted to go ahead and let you guys know that channel memberships are now open. Uh, you may be wondering, what are channel memberships? Well, it's basically like a sort of subscription service. You don't have to, of course, it's not like any of my scary stories or anything like that are going behind a paywall. But if you choose to, you can subscribe to the channel in a paid fashion. You can donate either $2, $5, or $10. It will go towards helping to support the channel, getting new equipment, that sort of thing. Uh, in addition, if you do decide to join the channel membership, there will be weekly creepypasta readings that I will post for members only. I may release them to the public after a month or two has been up, just so everybody can watch them. But those will be exclusive content for members for a while. That's just for if you decide to donate and support the channel, you get a little something extra once a week or so. I'll also post blogs and polls and stuff like that to members, so if you feel like supporting the channel, even if it's just a dollar or whatever, please give it a consideration. Without further ado though, let's get straight into the stories. Hi everyone, I'm really writing this out as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I feel really stuck. Any advice is appreciated but I'm not sure there's anything that could be said that would actually help much. I've personally tried just about everything. I'm going to start from the very beginning. This is a story two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house the intent was to rent it out once I'd completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone, and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was just the nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor, and he did indeed seem nice enough. He suggested we exchange numbers just in case I ever needed anything. I thought it was a pretty good idea at the time. I mean, what's the worst that could happen, right? Well, a few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally, the very day he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away, and let me know he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie, I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't alarmed though. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names, and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with this rambling text about how all a person ever needs in life is friends, and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or would just tell him I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than purely neighborly. One night I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I should not answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet, and told someone that he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer. He threatened to kill someone with it if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him, but they made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police had said my neighbor was on meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things just got even weirder. One day, I went out to my car to find a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car, and left. When I returned home, I found that it was gone. Shortly after arriving, I received a text from my neighbor that said this. Hey, uh, something or someone put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it out of the way for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I began to suspect he was the one who'd placed it there in the first place. Another time, I walked out of my house to see he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in his front yard. He came out and told me this was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. 
For the next couple of months, I did my very best to avoid him. He would text me, inviting me over, and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was starting to be uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I arrived home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. Around Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, Here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games. November 2012. What the fuck? All this time still sending me these texts. Eventually, I got fed up with it and stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50-pound flower pot at my front door. You know those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no-contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it twice and filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no-contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference, and during that time, someone attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of COVID. I was trapped inside 24-7 with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, the court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me he was sorry for all he'd done, and that he could tell right away when he saw me outside that he'd made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I was looking more beautiful. I went to court and provided all the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying that he knew he made me uncomfortable. I also told the judge I suspected that he attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is, the guy didn't even deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose the protection order at all. So in March 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything went pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he still did some weird shit, but that's just because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is, until he got hooked on drugs again. This time, I found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple months after I started dating my boyfriend. I suspect it was meant to be a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine on that end. We're still together and as happy in our relationship as we can be. New Year's 2021, I was suddenly awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for about seven minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when a stalker is sending threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lot. He called me a harlot and said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that he'd never said my name, so they couldn't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, There's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over $1,000 on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and other neighbors talking to invisible people who aren't there, going outside and screaming nonsense. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is going to have to die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the camera. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house screaming. Are you fucking proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everybody all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seems like he's off his medication again, 
That was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1am. He was cutting down his privacy fence horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he's outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means that it only stands about three feet tall now. This was the only thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my backyard, and now it's gone. All this is to say I'm fucking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure my neighbor won't try to kill me one day. Where I can be confident that he's not going to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats and finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them, so maybe it's partially my fault I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then I'm kind of stuck. I just don't know what to do. I'm tired, I'm angry, so I figured I'd write this to vent. If you made it this far, thanks for reading it all. There's still so many different instances that I've left out. I'm just so exhausted. Background I lived in a border town growing up. Mexico was pretty safe at that time, and high school kids going across the border was no big deal. I mean, our parents did it as well. It was the summer before I went to college, and I worked as a cocktail waitress at a nice club, catering to the white residents of the city, as well as people in the Air Force base. I was fast becoming friends with another waitress who was a blonde, blue-eyed girl, well off and whose parents left her by herself at their house by the lake. I was poor and Hispanic, but she was always very nice to me. The club closed at 2 a.m., if we wanted to have fun ourselves, we would have to go to Mexico because at that time friends' parties were done. This girl had been dating a rich Mexican guy. She was 17 or 18 and he was 19 or 20. He was considered a poppy, rich Mexican. The incident. After one of our shifts, my friend asked if I wanted to go with her and her boyfriend to a party in Mexico. I agreed. We were picked up in this beautiful black car by his driver and he had a couple of friends with him as well, all well off and very good looking. They took us to a club that knew them. As soon as we walked in, the waiters brought multiple bottles of good quality liqueur, mixers and garnishes. I had a blast and her friends were very kind and respectful. I did drink a little bit but not too much. We were only there about an hour when the bar started to close. The guy suggested we go to Boys Town. For those who don't know about the US-Mexico border, there's usually a red light district with drugs, drinks, and prostitution. I agreed to go because I felt safe with my current group. Rich Mexicans, probably well known, and I like adventure. I'm a bit of a risk taker. Any trouble would probably be from cops and we could just give the crooked cops some cash. We take this fancy car through a dark dirt road outside the small city until we see the flashing lights of Boys Town, like a movie set. We go to one of the bars and enjoy the show. It's a mix of drunk college boys, Mexican cowboys, and desperate women looking for their mark. I was surprised. There really is a donkey show, but it's not what you think. The whole night my friend's boyfriend and his friends had treated us to drinks. I was getting real drunk and needed to use the restroom. I walked down a red-lit hallway and encountered a prostitute with only a see-through scarf around her hips. She smiled at me and curled her finger to beckon me to a small room. Being the curious girl I am, I was tempted. She was beautiful with wavy black hair. I smiled and started walking toward her before I suddenly felt very strange. Surrounded, I guess is the feeling. I stopped and started to feel very uneasy. She continued to try and lure me into the side room. I shook my head and returned to the table with my friends. Another drink was waiting for me. I took a couple of sips and just felt uncomfortable. I told my friend I suddenly didn't feel so well and asked them to stop buying me drinks. This is the scary part. He turns over to me confused and says, We haven't been buying your last few drinks. Like, nothing? What the fuck? I quickly turned to the bar and noticed that several men I didn't know were looking my way. 
someone I had never met before was sending me drinks. I told the group that I had to go and that if we didn't leave I would make a scene. We left immediately. I headed home and didn't speak. I felt super wired and amped. I haven't felt like this before or after. It was just, I was feeling off and out of control. I got home at around 6am. My mother was just waking up and wondering what I'd done. I told her I had hung out with my friend, her boyfriend, and their friends. I proceeded to stay up wired for hours, trying to act normal. Maybe I'm being paranoid, but I think someone was trying to hurt me or trick me. I was a pretty girl who was poor. If I disappeared, so what? Was that prostitute trying to get money out of me, or was she luring me into a trap? Who was buying me those drinks that ended up with me feeling out of control? Context. I was 26 at the time, and I'm a lady. I needed gas, and it was around 11pm on a Saturday night. I pulled into a busy gas station to fill my tank, except it was completely bare, not a single car in sight. I also live in Alaska, so it was very cold this night, maybe about negative 10 degrees. Tired after work and just wanting to get home, usually I start my pump and sit in the car, due to the freezing cold. This time though, I had a really weird feeling that I needed to stand by the pump, so I did. I had just started pumping my gas when this little golden sedan pulled right in next to me. The guy got out and I started feeling hyper vigilant for some reason. He started cleaning his completely clean windows as he pulled back the squeegee and started towards me. I felt like I wanted to run away, but I stayed calm and continued pumping. He asked me if I would help him put windshield wiper fluid in his car because he ran out and he didn't know how to open the hood. I laughed it off and told him I didn't know either, which was a lie. He kept getting closer and closer to me, trying to lure me into his car by saying there's something under his seat he can't reach because he's too big. Now I'm five foot two and petite. This man was large and scruffy. Think Alaska wilderness dude. At this point I was freaking out and hitting the call button on the pump. He took a step back and started to go back to his car. I thought I was being smart. My gas was almost done. When I looked back to his car, I noticed that the insides of the doors had no handles, all except for the driver's side door. That freaked me out. I was putting the pump back and opening my door. I suddenly realized he was right behind me. He slammed my door shut and yelled, You're coming with me! Obviously, I refused. I was petrified. He grabbed my arm and slammed me against my car. I elbowed him as hard as I could. I started to scream at the top of my lungs. Thank God the gas attendant came with a big ass gun that night, because if not for him, I don't know what would have happened. The attendant pulled the video, and we made a police report. I called immediately after that guy took off. I never heard anything else about it, but I just hope he didn't manage to get some other poor girl alone. 